Stories of a Thousand Men from 1981 on Revenge of the 80s Radio. That's from Tenfold Tutor's Eddie, Old Bob Dick, and Gary album. The band, which mixed punk, Middle Eastern history, and jaunting tunery, is led by Edward Tudor Pohl, who is also a well-known actor, a game show host, and a lot of other things. He's on with me now. Welcome to Revenge of the 80s Radio, Edward. Ah, uh, hello, hello, Chris. I don't really like being described as a game show host, even though I must admit I did do one, but it was only five weeks, you know. Can I, I wonder if I'll ever be forgiven for that. Oh, are you kidding? I always wanted to be a game show host. I think I could do it. Hey, you're the next contestant on The Game. Well, it's great fun, you know. <laughs> it's, for five weeks, it's terrific fun. And you're in every shot, of course. I thought, this, this is what it must be like to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I'm in every shot. <laughs> yeah, you get to watch people do silly things. I actually got to see some of the uh, Crystal Maze clips. Yeah, that was fun. But I don't want it on my epitaph, though. That's what I mean. Oh, no worries. It, it's just on the radio here, so don't worry about that. But, Edward, you're acting, playing a one-man show, and there may be a new album in the works. Actually, there is a new album in the works, but we'll talk about all of that. Let's start from the beginning. Before you fronted your own band, before your time with the Sex Pistols, before you hit the punk scene of the mid-70s, you were writing music at an early age. Well, yeah, I mean, just as a kid in my bedroom, just sort of daydreaming. Um, yeah, it all started when I was a little boy, and we'd just got a television set, and Top of the Pops was a, a show, that I was allowed to watch, and the DJ was really excited. He said, straight to number one from last week, number 20, The House of the Rising Sun by the Animals. So anyway, I, I watched it, and I was so pretty blown away by this song. And I said to my, and I just knew I, I, why it was number one, because it, it just rang a little bell in me, you know. It made that little bell inside, and when that rings, you know you're onto a tune. So that I rushed upstairs to my bedroom. I hadn't even got a guitar then. And um, I just invented this song, you know, out of the blue. Um, it wasn't that good, but, you know, I always felt that I could also write a song that would go to number one. Why not? I always wanted to write the feel-good movie of the year, so if I can do that, you know. <laughs> I never well, did exactly. that. Well, you know, if you want to do it, go for it. I should try. I mean, it might take a few decades, but you'll yeah. get there in the end. But it would be nice to have my name next to the feel-good movie of the year. There we go. You took to punk quite well, though, and what attracted you to the music? Well, I was at drama school when the punk started, this punk scene started, and I instantly knew what it was all about because I had a lot of rage and anger in me. Um, I was a very mixed-up kid, you know, I'm completely all over the place. And I just understood it. And, but I stuck out at the end of the drama school, and I left in April 77. And, um, you know, I went for a couple of auditions for spear carriers in provincial theatre. And, the, and, of course, I didn't get the, the job. And I thought, well, why would they want to hire some skinny geezer out of drama school? There's hundreds of other ones. And then, um, you know, so I, I went straight into the, the music scene. I just got a music paper and answered an advert for, it said, Wild Frontman Wanted. So I thought, I, I thought I'll go for that. And, of course, I got it. Um, and that was a group called The Visitors. And later on, you put together Ten Pole Tudor. You did wind up in the Sex Pistols for a bit. Well, what happened was, the first, this group, the visitor, visitors that I joined, um, we got a, a re, we, our first review in, in a newspaper, and it said, the visitors are they are a really great band, apart from the bug-eyed cretin on lead vocals. In other words, me. And, of course, the boys said, hey, Ed, you've got to go, man. You're a liability. Um, they loved us, but they don't like you, so goodbye. So they sacked me, even though I was the most exciting man in the group. And um, so I was downcast, as you can imagine. But a few weeks later, one of the fans of the visitors, he rang me up. He said, Ed, the Sex Pistols are auditioning for a new singer. You've got to go for it. I thought, man, yeah, where? He said, tomorrow at the Duke of York's Theatre. I said, what time? He said, 11 o'clock. I said, thanks. And my heart was hammering, man. I knew I'd get it. I just knew I would. Because I had just more sort of manic angst. You know, and I knew I had more than anyone else. And so I did get the job, yeah. Well, you had to do that one. Somebody says, hey, you got to try for the Sex Pistols. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a no-brainer, of course. All right. No, but my heart was hammering. I just knew it was destiny. And, and the thing is, because I've been to drama school, I... I what I did when I got to the theatre, instead of going uh, to the front, where's all these other kids, 
automatically went to the front. I went to the stage door, you see, walked in the stage door and then walked onto the stage so you could command the entire auditorium. And I said, are these the auditions for Hamlet? You know, I got a big laugh. And if you get a laugh, when you, you know, when you're halfway there, that works, that works today as well. You know, if you get them laughing straight off, you can have a good gig. Well, you did get them laughing, and I'm with Edward Tudor Pohl here on Revenge of the 80s Radio, the great rock and roll swindle. I mean, you gotta love Who Killed Bambi. Hmm. Oh, I, um, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm, he, you know, he made me sing it like that. Um, we did, must have done about 50 takes, and he kept saying, no, go more punk, more punk, you're singing it too well. And, um, yeah, so, so I just had to sing it more and more crazy. And he just made a composite of all the craziest bits on, of the vocal takes. And that's the one you hear. But, um, yeah, it's kind of... But, I mean, I once met a lovely American girl who was hanging out with the Vibrators. And I was doing a gig with them. And um, she said to the Vibrators, Hey, guys, can I have a photograph? And then one of them said, Oh, do you want Eddie in the photograph? Meaning me. And she said, oh, Who was he? And that's, they said, That's Tempo Tudor. She said, Who's Tempo Tudor? He said, you know, he sang Who Killed Bambi with the Sex Pistols. She said, oh, my God, that's the most irritating song I've ever heard. No thanks. <laughs> um, she has no taste. So not everyone likes it. But I kind of sympathize with that. I thought, well, yeah, it is irritating. You know, it is, it is. No, it has to be a classic. But later on the next year, 81, Eddie, old Bob, Dick, and Gary comes out, along with Let the Four Winds Blow, and you hit the charts with Swords of a Thousand Men and Wonder Bar. Well, yeah, Swords was bought by every 13-year-old boy in the country. And that's all. That's, they're the only people who bought it. Oh, 12, 13, 14-year-old boy. No one else bought it. But there were, not, there were 350,000 of them to put it right up in the charts. That works. <laughs> well, it did. But the trouble is, there we were in the top 10 doing gigs, but the, the gigs weren't exactly packed out. And I thought, well, hang on. What would you have to do? I've been in the Sex Pistols. I'm in the top 10. Why isn't it packed out? It was only years later that I found out is because because they were all thirteen and they couldn't go to gigs. Well, don't you think that word would have gotten around that you do the whole show or you did some of the some full shows in full chain mail and maybe people would come out and see that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm exaggerating a bit, but yeah, that was a, yeah, that was, that was a pretty good fine days then. Yeah, we were riding on top of the world. Yeah, like conquering Vikings. We didn't exactly. Sing. We didn't do the whole show in chain, no. actually. Um, <laughs> but I, it's a lovely, um, it's a lovely legend that's gone round. So I never contradicted. Um, no, we didn't actually sing in real chainmail. I mean, you can get fake chainmail, which is sort of string with spray painted grey, silver, silver. You know, that looks pretty realistic. Yes, I would imagine the full chainmail would be. Uh... Well, let's just say you'd, you'd sweat a little more excessively during each show. Yeah, no, it'd be impossible. Anyway, you wouldn't be doing yourself a favor. I mean, I, I, I'd like to do five scissor kicks in the air. I mean, you don't want to put a lead weight on you when you're attempting that. <laughs> Not at all. Edward Tudor Pohl is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The band breaks up a little while later on. I mean, you're still on and off anyway. What people might not remember now or might not have realized at the time, you're also a sax player. Well, that's not actually true, uh, no. Chris. The hardest thing about learning to play saxophone is being able to afford one. So because I had a bit of money and I always fancied the sax, I mean, I'm a guitarist, but I bought a saxophone, you know, a fairly cheap one, but it was quite expensive. And um, quite quickly, I, I became quite good at it. And after about two weeks, you know, I could play a few notes, and I thought, man, I'm a genius. Um, so I played on a couple, a couple of tracks, but then two years later, I had not progressed beyond what I'd got to in two weeks. And the thing is, you've got to be so dedicated to your instrument to be good at it. So I ended up giving it to my saxophone genius, poverty-stricken mate, who couldn't afford one. Um, I just gave it to him. And I mean, he could play like a dream, you know. I mean, he's, he's pure music, you know. So I think that was a nice home for it in the end. And now, I've been studying the guitar and... I play it every day, every day, and um, after 40 years, I'm getting pretty good, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I am. I'm, I'm a slow learner, but it's great. I'm better now than I was two months ago, and I mean, that goes on every two months. Well, that's quick so learning. going to win. Yeah, there you go. That's quick learning. Shortly afterward, that lineup of 10-pole tutor uh, broke up a little possibly prematurely. 
You see, when the first lineup of the Temple Tudor broke up, that was the thing. The first lineup didn't last too long. We sort of imploded under the pressure, and um, various characters in the band that ended up not getting on very well. And, you know, people thinking they're Elvis Presley just because they've been on telly a couple of times. So it all went a bit sour. Um, so I immediately formed another band, uh, and we experimented with the Cajun, bit of jazz, free form. But, I mean, it, the, the crowd, as long as we played Swords of a Thousand Men, Who Killed Bambi, and a few others at the end, they didn't care what we played. But they had to hear the old Temple Tudor songs. So we always play them. At this point, you got into acting a lot more. Let's get into your film career in the next segment. I'm Chris Cordani with Edward Tudor Pohl, right here on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Wonderbar from Tenpole Tudor on Revenge of the 80s Radio, this time in Viking outfits for the video. With me is punk icon, musician, and actor Edward Tudor Pohl. Hi Ed- there, Chris. What happened was, I mean, by about 1984, having been doing work in, in bands the whole time, you know, I was a bit tired, and I wanted a break from all that. And um, what was bizarre was just because I'd been on Top of the Pops a few times, then the, the acting world suddenly wanted to, to, me to be in plays and things. So, you know, I started to get offered jobs. And I thought, what's this about? Just because I've been in a band, doesn't, why, do I, why does that mean I can suddenly act? But of course, you know, it's not to do with that. They just they thought, well, the guy's kind of a little bit famous, so let's try and get him into a play. Wasn't that the theory behind Absolute Beginners? Because there are a lot of musicians, I'm sure they all could act. Oh, no, Absolute Beginners, that was different. Julian Temple, I was the first man he'd cast in that film. Um, so when he took it to Susie Figgis, the casting director, he said, by the way, Ed to the polls playing uh, Ed the Ted. Actually, you all could act. Well, you know, acting, I mean, it's a little bit frivolous. I mean, mostly, it's just like a party trick acting. I mean, it's, it's not a serious thing. I, I, I have no respect, really, for it. I mean, it... I'm not really that sort of animal. Um, but anyway, I, was, I wasn't going to turn these parts down. And who would turn down a movie? You know, it's the ultimate adventure holiday. Going out to Africa or hanging out with Clint Eastwood. You know what I mean? It, it, it was kind of fun, but deep down I knew it wasn't what I was meant to be doing. Well, you got to have fun anyway. That's the way well, it works. Exactly. Right. No, but the trouble is for being an actor, and any listener, do not be an actor because... For, you know, on your CV, it looks great. You've, got, you've done a few things. But what about the four months in between each job when you're going, climbing the walls, going nuts? I mean, that's no fun. It's a waste of life. It's like you're sitting by the phone waiting for that thing to ring. It's like, all right, all right yeah. is it a job now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not that passive guy. I mean, I think actors are more passive than me. I want to make stuff happen. And, and anyway, actors, they're only midwives to other people's babies. They, they don't even write the song. You know what I mean? They're just servants. I don't see that they're very important, culturally. Well, maybe they're more important than DJs here. All we do is play music. (laughs) And we yap a bit. to you. You can be the best (laughs) DJ in America, and then, you know, then that's, well, for all I know, you are, man. But, you know, you can be great at everything, anything you choose to do. But, I mean, I'm only saying compared to music, it's frivolous um, acting. Well, a couple of notes about your acting career, though, that I found rather interesting. You were the only former Sex Pistol to be actually in Sid and Nancy. Yes. Although, I, let's, be, I, let's be honest, I, I, was, I was only in the Sex Pistols for a couple of months because then Sid Vicious died. Right, I'm with and you there on that. so did my part, and so did the Sex Pistols, in a way. I'm with you there on that. I just found that interesting because uh, you think they have some of the other guys make a cameo or two. No, they weren't interested because you had actors playing the Sex Pistols themselves. And I wasn't playing Tempo Tudor. I was just, I was playing a hotel man. Yeah, I have to, I have to be clear about that too. Yes, you, you didn't play yourself. You played somebody else. That was... Yeah, I was just an acting job. It was a morning's work and I got $500. Perfect. <laughs> but at what point did you say, hey, I'm actually good at this acting thing? Well, when I was at college, um, when I, I was expelled from school and I went to college, and I was doing a, a part-time drama course, and the lady had a bit of showed me a bit of faith and gave me some leading roles. And you know, we all thought I had a bit a seed of talent, you know. And in a way, you know, I probably have. But you've got to do, you've got to choose what you want to do and, and go for that. You can't be, you can't do both. I tried doing both. It doesn't work because, as Chairman Mao says, a man who's looking in two directions at once is is not moving. 
But you did manage to pull in career highlights from both sides there. Which includes, of course, playing the antagonist, the bad guy, uh, if you will, in Cole the Conqueror. <laughs> it was such fun to do. Oh, man, it was fun to do. But, and Kevin Sorbo was really nice. But, man, I think I'm dreadful in that. Um, yeah, I really do. But, I mean, it, it, as I say, I, I didn't, you know, it was well paid and it was such fun. And it was great hanging around with Dino De Laurentiis' daughter. And, you know, as I say, doing a movie is the best fun in the world. But I kept thinking, hang on, I'm just fiddling while Rome burns. I'm just having fun. I should be on. I've got work to do. You know, I should be writing, doing my music. And in the end, that's what it was. That's what I had to just get back to doing. And well, and then the phone stopped ringing. And then, so I start playing my guitar. And it does happen, but at least along the way, you get to show off your motorcycle skills on screen. So that, that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, I know which film you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that a was tunnel fun, of love. a little short film. <laughs> and that we got to Cannes Festival with that. And um, for, for the listeners, it was a short film about, I was on a motorbike. Um, and, but in Cannes, all the, the French Hells Angels, you know, gave us an escort. But the thing is, they've, all their motorbikes were so clean, like clean Hondas and things. Um, it was rather funny. You know, you, you could have eaten your breakfast off the bikes, which wasn't quite the greasy, oily image of uh, what I was doing. Edward Tudor Pole is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Now, uh, you said you went back to the guitar and obviously back to music. That was your calling. Ten Pole Tudor did reform a few times and played back and forth. You did record an album in 2009, but what were some of the things you did before that? Well, for, Chris, for the, I'll, I'll tell you, for the last 13 years, Pretty much every single weekend, I've gone out with my guitar um, on my own and tried to do the job of four men and get the whole place rocking. And it is possible, even though it doesn't sound possible, because if everybody's singing along, we can make a hell of a big noise. And that's what I've done every single weekend for the last 12 years. Nothing else at all. And I've never been happier. And my guitar playing isn't half getting good. And... So are the songs, and I'm going to record them next month so you can see if I'm telling the truth or not. You heard it here on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Edward Tudor Paul is working on a new album, has some studio time, and we're going to be hearing a lot more new music from him. Edward, talk about some of the music. Uh, it, it's obviously a lot different than it was before. You're not a guy that looks backwards, really. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to look backwards sometimes, but no, I generally I always want to move forward, of course. Um, because I haven't run out of creative juice. But one day I'll have to write me memoir, and then I've got to look backwards, haven't I? So this, I don't mind a little bit of looking backwards, Chris. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, musically, though. I, a lot of musicians are like that. They say, yes, we love the stuff we played back then, but there's more of me. Uh, th there's more to Edward Tudor Paul than what you heard back in 81. Well, that, yeah, that's interesting you say that, because a lot of the bands who were around then, you go and see them, and it's like it's still then. They just play the same set, they're exactly the same. Um, they just play the old set. Well, I mean, I've tried that for 20 years, just, just playing the old... It drives you mad in the end, and it's not creative. I mean, magic, it's like Beethoven. And, well, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're writing the music, you've got to write new music. So, yeah, and I, I... Well, I'm one of the exceptions where all my newest stuff's better than the old stuff. Um, but, of course, you've got to hear it to, to judge for yourself. But, you see, I'm a bit... I'm not very... I'm not very good at home recording and all that stuff. So I've got to rely, I've got, it's a question of getting enough money to go down the studio. Essentially, it comes down to money, you know, because you've got to pay the guy and you've got to pay the, well, the pay, the, pay the guys. You did record a single last year. Yeah, it's a little bit of fun. Um, we were camp I was camping on a field and this little girl came by. She was only nine and her dad was a guitar player, you know, playing in the sun. And um, I said, do you play the guitar? She said, no. So me and this young lad, we taught her a chord, very, you know, the G chord. And then we, st and we said, play that. And then we all started playing in G and she really loved it. And um, she said, Dad, I want a guitar for Christmas. And she said, is that right? She says, yes, I want a pink guitar. Because she was only nine. Of course she wants a pink guitar. <laughs> but then me and this young lad who just <laughs> popped up. We just started singing The Girl with the Pink Guitar. It was one of them instant holiday songs. So it's only a little bit of fun, you know. It's not, it's not, um, 
the most epic song in the world. But it's quite fun. I mean, well, well, isn't, isn't what that is, isn't isn't that what it's all about in a way too? Yes, putting the great stuff out there, but having fun while doing what you love to do. Well, you're right. You see, um, yeah, I've well said. It, there's, there's time for everything. There's time for frivolity, and then time for the heartfelt song. You don't see much heartfelt song, otherwise the audience gets bored. As long as the audience doesn't get bored, I mean, that, to me, that's the main thing. And I've never. The last thing the world needs is another averagely well, average rock song. I mean, you know, we we do not need another one of them. So I'm not going to release a song unless I think it's really good. Because you don't want one that's just quite good, do you? How boring is that? No, because quite good is kind of you know extremely stu- extremely stupendous is what I'm always looking for anyway on a radio show. So I suppose that's what you'll be looking for. Maybe even better than that with your music. Well, exactly. Yeah. Always go for something. Always try and be better than you the last time. Um, that's what the Rolling. That's why the Rolling Stones have kept going on so long because they always try and improve. They never sit back and thought, well, it, we, we just do it like we did last tour. It worked well then. It'll work well again. Could this all be because you have some royal blood in you? Ha <laughs> ha ha! Funny you should say that because I've been reading up on the, um, our history and yeah, well, I'm descended from Richard the Third's brother the Duke of Clarence. And um, I've, I've just found out about that last month. You're a descendant of the Duke of Clarence. Um, I understand that, looking back at my history, I, I may be at least somewhat, a little distantly, but somewhat related to uh, Edmund, Lord Warden of the War- Royal Privies. Oh, well, man, we were friends. As we, yeah. well, we knew each other back yeah. then. Yeah, so it's possible. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, exactly, we're all related. See, the thing is, um, how, how many other people are related? And, and then um, the, Clarence's daughter married um, the Duke of Warwick's daughter. And then because she had a better claim to the throne, when Henry VII came to the throne, because she might be a future threat, his, he married his cousin, Richard Pole, to her. So, and then so Margaret married Pole. And, so she, and Richard and Margaret Pole, we, we're descended from them, you see. But then again, how many hundreds and hundreds of other people are as well because it all multiplies doesn't it well this this makes you the earl of devonshire actually i should probably correct myself because I, i'm not as familiar with uh, how the royal family works but i believe you're, you're you're in line for that earlship right i'd have to kill a few people first <laughs> but all my ancestors would have killed them so maybe that's what i should do um <laughs> i don't know if i'm that ruthless <laughs> no but I'm, i've got uh, but anyway it's all a bit of fun uh, right. it doesn't really you know it doesn't make make you a better person no it's just interesting that's all uh, i mean your dad could be the king of england doesn't mean make you a nice guy no that's true does it? edward tudor pole is with me on revenge of the 80s radio again on the uh, new album coming out you'll be in the studio soon what my fans uh, expect to hear well you see it's interesting you use the word album because i just go one song at a time i, I get a song work it up, become obsessed with it, and then record it, and my whole world is just that song. Um, and then that process is repeated, and then when you've got about 12 that you're pleased with, then you say, well, let's call that an album. Um, so I can't really think of it collectively in the future as an album. I can just think of the, the five tracks I want, I'm going to record next month. But anyway, what you can expect is... Well, well, how can I put it into words? Beautiful rhythm, melody, hooks, nice. I mean, just perfect is what we're going for, of course. You know, sort of, sort of like the Beatles or Stones, you know. When, they, when the new Beatles album came out or a new Stones album came out in the old days, it was, it was a real kind of major, major day and people would buy the album and you'd listen to all the different sorts of tracks on it, you know, like the Stones album, fast ones, slow ones. But they'd all be great songs, so that's, I want to do something like that. Well, it's really frustrating that I can't get to America, you know, um, and I haven't been for so long because my, I, I know I'd go down well in America, and, and I've always wanted to go. And my heart's in America, and my granddad was an American, and, you know, I feel quite American. A lot of people from Europe come to America. They just take some time and hit some of the uh, larger and smaller places here. Maybe make a nice nice tour out of it. And people come back and say, hey, you're here. i got to check it out. But you do tour the UK. Yeah, the UK and a little bit of uh, and Norway and bits of Europe. But I'm, ma- I'm mainly big in, um, in England, especially the north of England. 
not so much the south. But I mean, I've got friends in every single city in, and town in England um, and Scotland and Wales. It's great. Um, but yeah, I don't know why I've not done more abroad. Well, I mean, they like me in Norway now. I've done a, a, the last three years. I've been playing the Pirate Festival out there. So it's sort of building up. But the thing is, because I'm on my own with a guitar, it's a hard sell. And they think, well, how good could that possibly be? It can't be that good, some old bloke with a guitar. But, man, it's extraordinary. There's nothing like it. No one plays like I do. Um, and it's a collaboration with the audience. Because Malcolm McLaren always said to me that the audience is, in fact, more important than the band, which I didn't initially agree with. But now, of course, I realise he was absolutely right. And it's down to the audience how good the gig is because they have to give something too, you know. They're not just passive receptors. And so if everyone's into it, we can have the, 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 the best fun ever. More, much more fun than with Temple Tudor because when you get them all singing, you know, you've got a band of, of you know, 2,000 people. Yeah, you could actually put some swords in their hands and make it swords of a 1,000 men. Well, that's happened a few times <laughs> after they bring swords. Um <laughs> Even though they bring that silly coloured plastic ones. Oh. <laughs> Maybe they're not allowed but, to... You know, <laughs> well, everyone likes the old stories of knights in armour, I think it is. You know, the old, that old stuff. Knights in armour. There's a romanticism the to that. Yes, there's definitely... Arthur. Yeah, definitely the romanticism to that. Of course, they don't realise that they can get stabbed in the eyes with those things and uh, you know, have their arms cut off rather easily. But hey, it well, works. Well, you know, it's much worse in the old days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all descended from that, you know. Edward Tudor Paul, thank you for joining us on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Where can some of our listeners find out about your one man shows? On Facebook. I've got a friend who does my Facebook page and he puts down the dates. Because um, I don't like the. I, I, I haven't got time to look in the computer. So that's what. what yeah, um, I think that's. Yeah, look up my Facebook and you'll see the dates there. Well, thank you again, Edward, and we really enjoyed having you on the program. Well, I'd really like to get back to America one day. We'd love to have you here, and when you're here, we'll put you on the show again. Definitely when the new music comes out, we want to talk about that, so enjoy the time in the studio, and the best of luck with the, uh, the new tracks. Oh, thank you so much. Let's play one of the new songs you've already recorded. It's called I've Gotta Go. New from... Uh -huh, very appropriate. New from Tenpole Tutor on Revenge of the 80s Radio.